Yes, if you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you to open up to Romans chapter 13. We're going to be in Romans 13, looking at verses 1 through 7 this morning. So when I started college, I went into college as an athletic training major. Uh, I had this hope of working sidelines during sporting events and working in clinics and helping athletes rehab. In my first year of school, I loved all the classes that I took. I got to take anatomy and physiology, uh, you know, exercise science, kinesiology, all of these things, and loved the coursework, but the commitment to the program was super high. You, you had this requirement and expectation your last three years of school to be on four or five different sports teams in the college as an athletic trainer. And the commitment for those who were going to be trainers was actually a little bit higher than it was for the athletes because you had to show up an hour before practice to help certain athletes prepare for practice. You had to stay about an hour or so after practice to help rehab athletes, and it was just this crazy commitment that consumed your life. And while I was enjoying the coursework, I wasn't enjoying it, enjoying it to the degree of the commitment, right? It was like, oh, I, I just, I don't know if I'm enjoying it that much. And so my sophomore year, I changed majors from athletic training to communication. That was also the time when God was starting to call me into ministry, and I became a communication major with an emphasis in public speaking, and it just kind of fit perfectly with what God was doing in my life. But in changing that major, there was a new course requirement that was added to the expectation of my degree, and it was foreign language. And I was terrible at foreign language in high school. I barely skated by. I took Spanish for like three years, and the only thing I could say coming out of high school was puedo ir al el baño, right? And that was probably bad, right? Just now how I said it, right? Can I go to the bathroom? That was like all I could remember. So I had to take a foreign language class. I took Spanish. I sucked it up for one semester, like finished, ground it out, you know, got to the end. I was like, oh, I'm done. Great. Until I learned it wasn't one semester. It was a whole year of language. And I was like, oh, I got to take another Spanish class? And I was just so disappointed and frustrated until I started looking at the, the catalog of courses. And I found that in the foreign language department, they offered a sign language class. And I was like, oh, that actually sounds really interesting. I had deaf grandparents and had challenges communicating with them. I was like, I can get my foreign language credit squared away and I can actually learn a skill that will be useful in my everyday life with my family. So I register for the class, I submit my classwork, my advisor calls me into his office to talk about it, and he's like, hey, I see you signed up for foreign language, uh, you signed up for sign language for your foreign language. I was like, yeah, I'm really excited about it. He's like, that's great, but it won't count towards your foreign language credit. I was like, why? He's like, well, technically, sign language isn't a foreign language. I was like, says who? <laughs> and he's like, me and the university. And he and I went back and forth. I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, when am I ever going to use Spanish, right? Like having this really naive, like 20-year-old thought, which I could use Spanish all the time now if I actually remembered any of it. But I was like, I can actually use sign language. I was telling him my grandparents are deaf. I have a hard time communicating, and you're going to block me, right, from communicating with my grandparents? Who do you think you are? He's like, hey, 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 I'm not saying you can't take sign language. I'm just saying it won't count towards your foreign language credit. You can take all the sign language classes you want, but you also have to take a real foreign language. And so I, he and I went back and forth some more. I left his office, and I was super frustrated. Like, I was like, I'm going to go write a letter to the dean of students. I'm going to petition my case. I'm going to just let them have it. And so eventually I succumbed, and I submitted, uh, I had to rework my schedule, submitted it again, and then he called me back in. We had one final meeting. And, and what I failed to kind of realize in the whole scope of that interaction was that there was one problem, and that problem was he had the authority and I didn't, right? It, it was his call to make, not mine, and when it was all said and done, I didn't like that. I didn't like that he had the authority and I didn't. An authority is a reality that we all will bump up against at some point in our lives. If you're a student, 
and your teacher has the authority, and your teacher says, you have to read 100 pages this week, and there will be a test on it next week, you have to read those 100 pages to take that test. If you're an employee, it's your employer who has the authority over you. And if they say, hey, you have to work late tonight, well, then you have to work late tonight. If you're a child, it's your parent who has the authority over you. And if they say, no, you can't go out with your friends tonight, guess what? You're going to stay in. And even if we like those who are in authority over us, our culture has negative perceptions of authority. There's this negative undertone of authority and the idea of authority in our world because our culture has this deep value of freedom, right? And anybody who seems to threaten my freedom instantly is suspect to me. And if they are really going to threaten my freedom, in a matter of seconds, I'm ready to go all William Wallace on them, right? Right, you remember William Wallace from Braveheart? At the end, he's like rousing all the troops to go into battle, and he's giving this rousing speech. They can, they can take our lives, but they will never take our freedom, right? Like we're ready to revolt at a moment's notice if somebody is going to threaten our freedom. And the way that we as a culture define freedom is freedom is the ability to do what I want, when I want, and how I want. Like, freedom is on my terms. That's how our culture tends to define freedom. But the question is, does the Bible define freedom in those same terms? And one area of authority in our world that is wildly emotionally charged is politics. You want to talk about politics this morning? Anybody up for that? <laughs> it's going to be a good time. We're living in a time when the political climate is like intensely polarized and divisive. And for many people, the perception is depending on who's in office, like we fear that our f- freedom and our rights are in jeopardy. And so it raises the question, as followers of, Christ, of Christ, like what is the role of authority in our lives, and how are we supposed to be responding to it? And Paul addresses those very questions as we cross into Romans 13, and this is what he says to start the chapter. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. Now, if the subject of politics isn't already emotionally charged enough, the idea of submission only ups the ante, right? There aren't too many words in our culture that make people bristle like the word submit or submission, especially when it's in reference to authority. Because if our culture values freedom, and if the the definition of freedom under which we operate is I do what I want, the notion of submitting to anyone is incongruent with that value and that perception. And so Paul here is saying, submit to governing authorities. Now, Paul isn't asking people to blindly submit. He actually goes on to give reason why he would say and suggest that. He says, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. So the reason governing authorities have authority in the first place is because God has given it to him. Jesus says a very similar thing in John 19. In John 19, Jesus has been arrested. He has already been tried by the Jewish Sanhedrin, and he has been submitted to Pilate for execution. And there's this mob of people yelling, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate Pilate is trying to understand what's going on because he has this mob of people bringing Jesus to him, And he's trying to figure out who is this guy, Jesus, because the Jewish people bringing Jesus to Pilate are saying, he is the son of God, or at least he claims to be the son of God. And so Pilate is trying to figure out who Jesus is. He's asking Jesus questions. Jesus is giving him these strange, cryptic answers. And he says to Jesus, don't you realize that I have the power to either free you, 
or crucify you? And Jesus' response is, you would have no power over me if it weren't given to you from the one who is above. Implication being, God is the one who grants those in authority with the authority that we have. So the implication also is when we surrender to governing authorities, we're not just surrendering or submitting to them, we're also submitting to God, which means the reverse of that is true. Paul Paul goes on to say in verse 2, Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. So Paul is saying that the reality of governing authority is that it has been put in place by God. Therefore, submission to authority is submission to God, and resistance to governing authorities is resistance to God. And not only does Paul speak to the reality of governing authorities, he also speaks to the purpose of it. He goes on to say in verse 3, For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do what you want to be free. Do, what, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be condemned, not condemned. So, so Paul is saying here that if you do what's right, and you follow in line with where authority is leading you, you'll be fine. I remember when I was in high school, I was in a class. It was just like the beginning of class, and the phone in the classroom rang, and the teacher goes to get the phone, and she's like, "Uh uh-huh, yep, uh uh-huh. He's here, and she looks right at me. And then like everybody in the class also looks right at me. She goes, yep, I'll send him down right away. She hangs up the phone, and she's like, Brian, you need to go to the principal's office. And everybody, they're like, there's this like, <gasps> in the classroom, right? And I get up, and, and thinking like, like what, like, what am I being called to the principal's office for? Like, did I cut class? I'm like starting to rehearse all these things in my mind, or like, say, did I, did I cut class? Did I do something wrong? Did, you know, all of the possible scenarios, I'm like, I can't think of anything I did wrong. And I walk into the principal's office, and they're like, you've been nominated for some award or whatever. And I was like, oh, thank goodness, right? (laughs) But I had no no reason to fear because there wasn't anything that I had done. If I had done something wrong, I would have had all sorts of reasons to fear. And Paul is saying when you follow in line with authority, you, you have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about. And then he goes on to say the reason why God has put authority in place is this, verse 4. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. Meaning God puts authority, people in authority, for the good of the community. And if you're going along with that good, there's nothing to fear. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. Saying authorities are there to be administers of justice. Because God is a God of justice justice and righteousness. He goes on to say, they are, they are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoers. Basically, they are there to ensure justice. Paul is saying that the purpose of authority essentially is to maximize the good in the community and minimize evil, to administer justice when necessary, but they're also put in place to ensure order over chaos. Because not only is God a God of justice, He is also a God of order. And you see this in creation. In creation, as God is creating everything, He's doing it in a very orderly manner to bring order to the world. And then He creates Adam and Eve and puts them in the world to continue to cultivate the order that He has put in place. But then, once sin enters the world, like all of God's order starts to fall apart and destruction and chaos starts to surface, and you have this downward spiral of destruction and chaos once sin enters the picture. Because the very first thing that happens after Adam and Eve sin is their sons get into a fight, and Cain kills Abel right away. And then the next thing that happens is Cain has a grandson named Lamech. 
And Lamech has this mantra. If Cain has been avenged seven times, Lamech 77 times. Meaning I'm going to take revenge on whoever I want to take revenge on. Because I'm going to administer justice my way in the way that I see fit. And so you have this progression. God creates this good world. Then chaos enters. And you have this downward progression from chapter 3 to chapter 6 in the book of Genesis. And you find in Genesis 6 verse 5 it says, Every inclination of the human heart was only evil all the time. And so God puts authority in place as a way to try and bring order in a world that otherwise would be left to itself and be wildly chaotic. And it's interesting, too, if you keep reading through the Old Testament and you get to the book of Judges, like the book of Judges is one of the darkest, bleakest, most depressing books in all of the Old Testament. And in the refrain that you find through that, old, that, that book, is that you find it at the end. It's the the very last sentence in the book of Judges, 25, 21. In those days, Israel had no king. There was no governing authority in Israel at that time, and everyone did as they saw fit. Some translations say they did right what was right in their own eyes, meaning When left to ourselves, everyone has their own sense of right and wrong, their own sense of justice and righteousness. And if there is no wider structure, because of sin in our lives, we will be quick to be our own judge and jury and administer whatever justice we deem to be appropriate in this world by whatever means we deem necessary. And so what Paul is saying here is that God puts authority in place in order to maximize the good, minimize evil, and ensure order over chaos. That's why he says in verse 5, Therefore you must submit, specifically submit to governing authorities, not only because of wrath, not just to keep your nose clean, but also because of conscience. Meaning you should have some conviction about it. Now, if you are dialed into this, like this probably raises all sorts of questions for you. It's probably disconcerting at some level. And you're probably like, I don't know if I like this right now, right? And one of the things you're probably thinking is, are you saying that God somehow has chosen every government leader? Like for such a time as this, God has put Putin in place, in power, in Russia. And he's okay with that? Like is that, is that what we're saying, Right? And, and he repeatedly says that these people who are in authority in governing positions are God's servants, which raises another question. Like, do they see themselves as God's servants? Because if they do, that could be really troubling. Now, some Christians will say that. Some Christians will definitely say when the individual they want to be in power and in office is in power and in office, they're like, that person was put there by God. Like there's this divine covering over them and we must surrender because it's surrendering to God. But that could be wildly scary, right? Because what if they are a really bad leader? What if they are a bad leader with bad character and they're corrupt because history is full of those. Like when you think of Hitler, you think of Stalin. Like are we trying to say that somehow God put them in place? Because if they think that, and they think that they are God's servant, that could be a recipe for disaster, and it has been throughout history. And so the question is, what in the world are we supposed to make of this? And this was true for Paul. This was true for Paul in his day when he was writing the book of Romans, because the emperor in Rome at that time was Nero. And to recall the little Spanish that I know, Nero was no bueno right? (laughs) He was a bad, bad dude. He was ruthless and brutal. He killed his own mom, his own mom. He killed two of his wives, 
He killed his brother-in-law because he was worried his brother-in-law was going to try and take the throne from him. He is responsible for the execution of Paul and Peter, and he wasn't nice to Christians. It's thought that he burned down half of the city of Rome to create space for a new building plan, and he blamed the Christians for that. And then there's also reports of the way he tortured and executed Christians and lit them on fire and then put them in his gardens, in his palace, just to light it up in the evening. Nero was not a good guy. And so is Paul saying, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We just submit to Nero because he's in charge, and God put him there, and he's God's servant, and that's our lot in life. Is that really what he's saying? And unfortunately, this passage oftentimes gets plucked from its context and used in very negative ways in order to force people and coerce people into submission when maybe they shouldn't. Now, when you look at what Paul has been doing up to this point over the last chapter, if you go back to chapter 12 and you look at the flow of thought of what Paul has been saying, I think the true message of what Paul is trying to capture here is very simple and very high level. Because if you go back to the beginning of chapter 12, Paul will say in verse 2, don't conform to this world, but what? Be transformed. And how do we do that, he says? Through the renewing of your mind. And that's not just saying, hey, we need more Bible info in our lives. Rather, he's saying you need to live by a different story. Not the story of power and politics of our day, not the story of trying to climb the corporate ladder to get ahead and advance yourself, but we live by the story of Jesus, who considered himself nothing, right? Who, in comparison with God, considered himself nothing with God. Meaning, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he can, made himself nothing, taking on the likeness of a human, taking on the likeness of a servant. He made himself obedient, found himself obedient, and became obedient even to death. We live by that story, not the stories of our world that are trying to fight and run over people for power and influence at all costs. So he's saying we renew our mind in that light. And then if you keep reading through chapter 12, he talks about in verse 3 through 14 what it means to live in the context of Christian community in a church like this. And then as you move into the last part of chapter 12, he starts to talk about what it means to live towards the community. How it is we engage with the world around us, especially when the world is persecuting us. He says, bless those who persecute you. Love your enemies. And so he's saying that in regards to, as well now, authority, governing authorities, even governing authorities that are evil and corrupt. So it seems as though what Paul is doing here. Is he speaking to something in more general terms rather than situational terms? Meaning, it's not as though Paul is trying to parse out here. It's only five verses. I mean, I didn't do the word count on it, but it's probably less than 200 words. He's not parsing out the line between God's sovereignty and free will when it comes to electing different governing officials. And and I don't think he's saying that every political leader is hand-selected by God for this very moment in time, nor is he disapproving of civil disobedience to expose corrupt power structures in our world. And he's not even saying that you can't disagree with those in authority. I think the general call in this passage is to simply be good citizens, which is a very biblical idea. Because the concept in Scripture is that we are foreigners, strangers, aliens. We are people who live in exile. If you go back to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, the people of Israel are in exile. And Jeremiah the prophet is encouraging them to seek the welfare of their city. Be good citizens. Do good for the city because if the city prospers, you prosper. Be good citizens and shine a light in a dark situation and in a dark world. Because the last few verses of this passage are real simple, real practical. He's basically saying, be good citizens. Pay your taxes and be respectful. This is what he says in verse 6. This is why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. 
Give to everyone what you owe them. Essentially, be fair, be reasonable. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. It's almost as though what Paul is saying is that if we are called to renew our minds, a renewed mind respects authority. A renewed mind respects authority. It doesn't mean you have to agree with authority. If authority is leading you to do something that would be anti-Scripture, that would be contrary to anything the Bible says, like there are plenty of examples in Scripture where you resist that. The book of Daniel is full of them. Daniel doing things that are more in line with following God than the government of his day and is commended for it in the Scriptures. A renewed mind respects authority. And this might seem kind of obvious, like, yeah, 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 we should be respectful people. But we live in a world characterized by disrespect. We live in a world that is ready to sling mud, throw people under the bus, call people out, make up stories, fabricate lies, so that we can get ahead. And the call of Christians, the call of following Jesus, is a radical calling, that we live countercultural, that we live counterintuitive to the culture around us. And believe it or not, being a respectful individual in a disrespectful culture is countercultural. It, it's, it's a radical thing when you are respectful in the face of disrespect. And so maybe the invitation of this passage is to simply exercise and practice respect for those around you, for those in authority over you, even if you disagree with them, even if you have a hard time with them. Because respect, alongside disrespect, bears witness to a new reality. So when we um, came up here in 2010, we were living in Atlanta at the time, we came up here in 2010, 2011 to visit Becky's family for Christmas. And Scott Walker was all over the news. I can remember being in lacrosse, like walking into some restaurant, and it was Scott Walker this, teacher's union that, Scott Walker. I mean, I was like, people up here are not happy with Scott Walker. (laughs) Teachers especially do not like him, right? Now, the ironic thing in coming here, and some of you know this, like Scott Walker used to go to Meadowbrook Church. Like, I don't know where he sat, but, I mean, there's not that many seats in here. Probably had his own little spot somewhere when he was governor. And I can only imagine the awkwardness and the tension that must have existed for those who are teachers and educators who are frustrated with him while he was attending here. I'm sure it was palpable. I'm sure it was thick. But what if you were a teacher who disagreed with what he was doing, disagreed with the policies that he was making, And you happen to be at school, and there were people who were just railing on him. And you could empathize with their frustration. And you could even find yourself agreeing with the way that they were upset. But at the end of that conversation, you were able to say, yeah, but you know what? He really is a good guy. And they would be like, who are you? Why would you say that? And if you were a member at Meadowbrook Church, you'd be like, well, it's because I know him. How do you know him? Well, he and I happen to go to church together. And we happen to worship together. And we take communion together. I'm actually in a neighborhood community with him. They would be like, oh. They would have no paradigm where you could say, yeah, I, I, I disagree with him. and I don't like what he's doing. But in the end, I actually love him because he's my brother in Christ. (laughs) That would blow people's minds. Like they would not know what to do with that. And so the reason we can submit to governing authorities and disagree with governing authorities, but still show respect to governing authorities, is because we live by a different story. And we have a different story perspective. It's a perspective of a new reality that comes from a new mind and a renewed mind that understands our true citizenship isn't here, but it's elsewhere.
Paul says in Philippians. Love the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await our Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control. Let's just remind ourselves for a second. In control. Is Biden in control? Is Tony Evers in control? Is Putin in control? The Lord Jesus Christ is in control and sovereign somehow over all things. And somehow, some way, someday, he will return and call everybody to account. He will return and he will administer justice like nobody has ever seen. And he will make all things right. Him, who by the power that enables him to bring un- everything under his control, he will transform. There again is that idea. He will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And so we live by a different story. We live under a new king who is a better king, a better ruler than we could ever imagine. And we submit ourselves first and foremost to him. And we await for the day when he will return to make all things right and all things new. And in the meantime, we live towards this world in a way that reflects the goodness of God in the here and now. Even when we find ourselves in difficult, uncomfortable, unpredictable, strange, and uncertain situations. Kind of like the world we live in now. To say there's a new king, there's a new reality, there's a new way. Will you join me? So may you see that your true citizenship is with Christ. May that free you to respect authority with which you disagree with. And in doing so, may you bear witness to the reality of a new and better world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift that we have in Jesus Christ. The gift of his death that has started this project of all things being made new, the justice that he enacts through that death, the resurrection that he has that communicates his power and his strength and might even over death in the hope that we have that one day he will return to put everything right. In the meantime, Lord, we ask that in the here and now, we would be faithful to you. We would have eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts that's open and willing to follow you no matter the cost, and that in doing so, we would bear witness to the fact that a new and better world is on its way. We pray this in your name. Amen.